Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the World Affairs Council Upstate speaker event featuring global communities and the topic of Beyond Health, how COVID-19 will reshape international development. We appreciate your time today. Um, a reminder, real quickly, is that we've asked that you remain um, silent with your video and audio feeds off. Please type in any questions through our chat feature and our moderator will give them to our speakers as we go. Today we are really um, excited to have global communities join us, in particular because of the amazing work they do for our world um, and especially for developing countries. Our first speaker that I'd like to introduce is Mr. David Weiss. David became Chief Executive Officer of Global Communities in 2010, having previously been a board member since 2004 and then Chairman of the Board. Uh, Mr. Weiss was the Senior Policy Advisor at the global law firm DLA Piper for 13 years, advising on international trade and foreign policy matters. Mr. Weiss also spent 18 years with the federal government. This is a broad range of experience in international policy. He was special assistant to the director of the Peace Corps, a member of the US Foreign Service, economic officer in Haiti, special, um, excuse me, staff aide to the secretary of state and special assistant to the deputy secretary of state. He also had experience with trade through his position as assistant US trade representative for North American Affairs in charge of NAFTA. Other senior positions for Mr. Weiss included um, off positions in the Office of U.S. Trade. David received a de degree, um, excuse me, an MSFS from Georgetown University um, and a degree, a Bachelor of Arts from Hamilton College. On the side, in all of his extra time, as I can see, David is a member of the Board of Directors of the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, of which both Rob and I are also a part. Um, we welcome him today, and joining him is another member of Global Communities, Ms. Carrie hessler Radley. Carrie is the President and CEO of Project Concern International, which is a Global Communities partner. She also serves as president of Global Communities, a dual role. Ms. Hessler was formerly the director of the Peace Corps from 2012 to 2017, um, the Peace Corps being America's most probably iconic international volunteer service agency. Before being appointed to the Peace Corps by President Obama, Carrie worked as the vice president and director of the Washington DC office of John Snow, Inc overseeing the management of public health programs in over 85 countries. She also served as the lead consultant on the five-year global HIV AIDS strategy for the President George W. Bush Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief and was the founder of Special Olympics in Gambia. What a very distinctive career she has had um, educationally, she holds a Master's of Science in Health and Policy and Management from Harvard University. We have a local tie-in with Ms. Uh, hessler Radley also that I'd love to mention, and that's Dining for Women. Carrie serves on the National Board of Directors with our own Karen Center here on UI staff, and we really appreciate her involvement there. Rounding out our speakers today is our moderator, our very own Mr. Rob Rowan. Rob is Executive Director and President of Global Action Coalition, which he founded. Global Action Coalition works in both Nepal and uh, Djibouti and specializes in educational opportunities, um, really encouraging development and growth among young people and women in particular. Rob serves currently as the Chair of the World Affairs Council Upstate here for Upstate International and is a board member as well. Uh, one of Rob's projects that he's doing um, on behalf of our whole upstate region is helping World Affairs Council Upstate create a world conference. And I have to say, this is an enormous undertaking we're so excited about. We'll be partnering with Clemson University, Furman, and USC Upstate, hopefully 
in the next year to year and a half to make that happen. It'll be a unique opportunity here. Mr. Rowan was also previously involved with the International Coalition of Military Officers, where he was awarded the title of Honorary Ambassador to CENTCOM. He also undertook a recent trip to Strasbourg University in France to give a keynote address at their Castle Talks Conference mm -hmm. on healing the scars of history using diplomacy, development, and defense. Rob, I'm going to turn this over to you. Um, we are so excited to have all of you participate today. A reminder, these events are brought to you as part of World Affairs Council Upstate's mission to engage our community in topics re regarding foreign policy, global impact issues, and current events. If you're not a member of the Council, please take this opportunity to learn more about us. And if you enjoy the event today, Rob will tell you at the end how to learn more about this council system. Rob? Ah, hello, everybody. Before I, we get started, I just want to thank our media sponsor, and uh, they're really uh, great for them to be doing this. That is Community Journals and the Greenville Journal. And I thank them and Mark Johnston for stepping up and putting the word out. This webinar is special for me because uh, I have, as you've heard, spent time in third world countries and I share the passion of our two uh, speakers today. David and I met in about four years ago uh, at the U.S. Global Leadership Conference in Washington where he is on the board and I'm an advisory board member, a little less than that, but, but it was really uh, incredible to hear him speak and so I invited him to speak at the St. Pete Conference on World Affairs and on several panels. He was great. So. Um, We've developed a friendship. I have not met Carrie until recently, but um, I'm amazed by what she's done, as you will learn. And one of the things that's fascinating is not only did she serve on the Peace Corps uh, and be involved with it, but her, I think she said it's actually four generations of connections to the Peace Corps. So that is pretty neat. So um, that's great. So thank both uh, David and Carrie for coming and doing this. Um, so I want to say it is fitting at the age of COVID-19, which is where we're at, to have these experts share with you the challenges that they are finding around the world. I think their stories will touch you. And um, at this point, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to give each of them a few moments uh, to talk a little bit, give you a little taste of who they are. And after we're done, um, as your thoughts come up, please uh, use our chat function and uh, ask some questions and I will, uh, as we get going, put them into our conversation. So at this point, David, I'd like for you to start off and, uh, and share with us a little bit about yourself and whatever you'd like to share about the organization and your work. Well, thank you so much, Rob. Uh, we really appreciate your invitation, um, the invitation from the World Affairs Council Upstate. And on behalf of Kerry and myself also, thank you, Tracy, for your very kind introduction. Um, and we really appreciate the work that the World Affairs Council Upstate uh, does and all of you do to foster an exchange of international cultures and ideas and, and sharing information around world events. I think at a time like this, your mission is more important than ever before. We're living, of course, through an historic moment, uh, one that will reshape our country and the world for decades to come. <clears throat> the impact of COVID-19 uh, of the pandemic is being felt in every aspect of our lives and our work. In the field of international development, we're watching fundamental shifts happen right before our very eyes in real time. Global Communities works to advance community-led change that improves the lives and livelihoods of vulnerable people across the globe. Our central goal is to build the capacity of communities to direct the development of their own lives and livelihoods. Earlier this year, we announced a merger with Project Concern International, or PCI, and together our programs deliver sustainable change to millions of people in over 35 countries around the world. We first got to know PCI when they partnered with us in rebuilding the first poor neighborhood in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, following the devastating earthquake there in 2010. And later, when we again partnered together in responding to the Ebola crisis in Liberia. Together with PCI, we've now been responding quickly to the COVID-19 pandemic's impact uh, on global health around the world. 
the same skills that we utilize in those earlier humanitarian responses. Things like, for example, around local community engagement, how we empower communities, sanitation and hygiene, contact tracing are invaluable and we've pivoted in many of our country programs today to COVID response activities, building more hand washing stations, teaching the importance of social distancing, teaching local villagers how to make face masks. In Syria, where global communities provides essential humanitarian work, uh, including protection, water, sanitation, and hygiene services, uh, in one particular case in Syria to the Atme camp, which is a uh, a cluster of camps home to over 150,000 displaced persons in Northwest Syria. And there we're increasing as a response to COVID our water trucking. Uh, there's no access to water in the camp except by truck. So we're now bringing in over 700 trucks daily, uh, which is a huge logistical effort. It's, um, we're providing additional clean water to camp residents. We're distributing additional soap and hygiene supplies offering information on proper hand washing and ways to install additional hand washing stations throughout the camp. And I know PCI just recently has uh, been contracted here in the United States by San Diego County to do contact tracing. But the effects of the coronavirus ripple far beyond health. For vulnerable communities, the economic effects <clears throat> are an immediate threat to survival. The coronavirus pandemic is making the poorest poorer and the hungriest hungrier. Here in the United States, of course, we see on the news, we see in some of our local communities, uh, Americans across the country waiting in lines, in long lines at food banks and applying for unemployment for the first time. Most of the developing countries where we work don't have social safety nets or food bank networks. In communities where breadwinners work in the informal sector, a single day out of work can push a family into poverty. It's estimated that earnings for 2 billion workers in the informal job sector around the world could decline by 82%, <clears throat> with 70 to 100 million people pushed into extreme poverty. Until the pandemic hit, we had been seeing extraordinary progress in the global fight against extreme poverty. As long as I've been involved in development, which is about 20 years and Carrie for virtually her whole career, the trend line has always moved in a positive direction. <clears throat> Just a few examples. In 1990, 36% of the world's population, or 1.9 billion people, lived on less than $1.90 a day. By 2016, that number had dropped to 10% of the world's population. On every one of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, from clean water to quality education to health, we've been seeing meaningful, measurable progress year in and year out. Just since 2000, um, just since the year 2000 in India and Bangladesh alone, over 300 million people were lifted out of poverty. That's an incredible data point, 300 million people, not only whose suffering is, is reduced, but who can live productive lives, who can contribute to their communities and their countries in the world. It was envisioned that in this decade, we would be in the last mile of this fight, the decade when extreme poverty would be eliminated altogether. But instead now, we face a whole new challenge. The World Bank tells us the global poverty rates will rise instead of fall for the first time since the 1990s. The United Nations has predicted that the impact of the pandemic will push half a billion people into poverty. It's still early in the coronavirus crisis, and in many ways, we're in the first and immediate phase of response. <clears throat> but the long-term effects are already being felt, with more looming that we can't even predict. So as global development leaders, as humanitarian response professionals, as global citizens, we have to plan for this new reality. It might feel like a hamster wheel, going back to solve problems we thought were already solved. But we can't lose hope. You've seen proof that real progress is possible, and smart development can make a difference. At Global Communities, we believe in a locally-led approach. No one knows better what a community needs than the families that live there. So we start with ground truthing and meeting with people at the community level. We've been asking the communities we work with about the impact of COVID-19, but the results are pretty dire. 
And first of all, just having this all important communication with people at the community level is newly challenged by the combination of COVID and the digital divide. In many of the developing countries where we operate, <clears throat> which are also under stay at home orders, COVID is putting a magnifying lens on the digital divide. You know, we hear, we've heard about this for years in our own country and rural communities, remote communities, as well as poor urban areas where that still don't have adequate internet access. In the developing world, where most people don't have laptops, where many have cell phones, but almost nobody has smartphones, reaching them and engaging with them has become more difficult. One of our staff members was just telling me the other day about trying to have a virtual meeting with a local community municipal and their municipal authorities. And they had one a municipal office with one desktop computer and there are several dozen people sort of trying to huddle around <clears throat> and work through this one computer and but also with their face masks and trying to maintain social distance and it just didn't work. Post-COVID, international development will need to find ways to address these problems for we all know that this is not the last time the world will be faced with a pandemic. The VITAS group, which is a local which is a wholly owned for-profit subsidiary of global communities, operates a network of microfinance operations, microfinance companies, predominantly in the Middle East region, providing credit to micro, small, and medium enterprises. So think of the family-run grocery store or a local little motorcycle repair shop. Local businesses that are not well served by the formal financial markets. These access to credit or lending programs have been real job creation machines. And the Middle East region where we operate them is, as you know, a pretty tough neighborhood. There's a bulging youth population and high unemployment. And an unemployed 20 year old just hanging out idly on the street corner is a ripe target for recruitment by extremist organizations. So job creation is critical. Extending credit to these essential businesses that supply much needed goods and services <clears throat> and employ their neighbors is more important now than ever, especially in countries without government-based programs like the one we have here, the Pay Paycheck Protection Program. In order to understand the impact of this pandemic on vulnerable businesses and households, we conducted a survey in six countries where they serve uh, a combined 90,000 active uh, lending clients and have an outstanding loan portfolio of over $230 million. One of the biggest worries for small businesses, business owners that were surveyed was being forced to close their businesses, laying off employees after a dramatic drop in income. Approximately 72% of surveyed borrowers in Iraq and 71% of those interviewed in Lebanon were most concerned about the economic impact of the pandemic and their ability to continue to earn an income to support their families. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? But again, in these countries, there are no PPP programs, there are no social safety nets, no food bank networks for them to go to. The need is real. The question is, how should we respond? And maybe even why should we respond? After all, America's facing its own challenges. Right here at home, our own budget deficits are ballooning to unprecedented levels. But as globally minded professionals, you no doubt know that our national security, for our economic pr prosperity, and for our health and safety, we're inextricably linked to the rest of the world, like it or not. A, a disease threat anywhere is a disease threat everywhere. <clears throat> it only takes 36 hours for a pathogen to spread around the globe a threat that is even more real when 70% of the world still remains unprepared to prevent emergencies. There's no question that this is a central challenge of our time. As global professionals, the most urgent question we can ask is, what are we doing to rise to the challenge and meet this moment with innovative, powerful solutions that keep people safe, healthy, and thriving? And I'll stop there and turn it over to you, Carrie, to continue on with a few more further remarks. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, David, for painting that um, vivid picture of the impact of COVID-19 on the world and particularly the developing world. Before I begin my remarks, I just want to say um, again how grateful I am to be with you today. When I heard about this event, I really jumped at the chance because I really love Greenville. It's, I think it's one of the most beautiful places in the U.S. It is just a gem um, uh, in terms of your commitment to all things international. And it's extraordinary that so many wonderful organizations are headquartered in that relatively small place. So I just want to say what a privilege it is to be among all of you. I am joining you today from Northern Michigan, which is where I call home, although I live in Virginia uh, most of the time. You know, when I left Peace Corps in 2017, after serving in leadership there for more than seven years, I was a deputy director first and then I became the director. I really wanted to find an organization that honored the knowledge and the expertise and the wisdom of communities around the world. Uh, it was important to me that I find an organization that was committed to empowering communities to lift themselves out of poverty. And I found that in PCI and now Global Communities. And David referred to that so beautifully and gave you so many examples of, of Global Communities commitment, our, our now collective commitment to working with communities and helping them to lift themselves out of poverty. So much of what is done in the development space today is about changing people and you know, don't get me wrong, behavior change is incredibly important and it's critically important to introduce new approaches and new technologies that can save lives and improve livelihoods. But equally important, and maybe even more important, is recognizing and growing the power and potential that resides within. Because what I have learned over my more than 30 years in this field is that the most important asset that any nation or any community has in the fight against poverty, including the fight against COVID, are the people themselves. And that is as true here in the United States as it is overseas. What I have learned is that talent, intellect, and motivation are equally distributed around the globe, but opportunity is not. I have traveled to many countries and worked in many countries, over a hundred actually, because of the international uh, nature of my entire career. And as I have met people overseas, I have always kind of wondered, how will we ever know what kind of incredible talent resides within the imagination of a 14-year-old girl from South Sudan, for example? If society looks at her and only thinks of the number of cows she will be traded for in marriage, how will we ever discover if the young boy in Kenya who is tending his garden is capable of the compassion and humility of Nelson Mandela? How will we ever know if the young woman who is teaching her children to read in El Salvador, because there's no school now, and so she's doing the teaching from home, how will we know if she's capable, capable of dreaming life-changing dreams like Bill Gates? Our mission is to open the doors to these extraordinary people and let them lead, let them innovate, give them the tools they need to solve the next generation of solvable challenges, including COVID. Just as one example, and I love to tell stories. Anyone who knows me knows I love to tell stories. We know that women and girls, and especially those that are most marginalized, are among those who suffer most during emergencies like COVID. So in times of economic downturn, girls are more likely to be exposed to domestic violence or sex trafficking or other forms of exploitation. Women and girls are more likely to serve as caregivers for sick family members and are therefore at much higher risk of infection. So diseases like COVID-19 only highlight existing challenges to their well-being. And we know that women and girls are absolutely key to conquering COVID. So as an example, in India, where we're working in Bihar, which is one of India's poorest states, we're working on a women's empowerment, health, and nutrition program that's sponsored by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the government of Bihar. And because that program works hand in hand with the government, it has enormous scale. We work through self-help groups, which are already, was, they were part of the culture in India already. Since that program, began four years ago, it has reached 15 million women and 60 million families. So the scale is enormous and that's possible in a place like India if you work closely with the government. 
ensuring the programs are owned by the government and the communities we serve is absolutely key to sustainable development and key to our approach. So I visited that program about a year and a half ago, which was long before COVID. And I met an extraordinary woman named Sani, who I'm continuing to stay in touch with. She told me about what a difference it made in her life when she joined our Women's Empowerment Program. Like so many women in rural corners of Bihar, after she got married, she was taught that her place was in the home. She stayed mostly indoors because she was embarrassed to show her face to people outside her family. She told me that she never spoke the name of her husband in public for fear of bringing shame to him. And when she went out, she kept her eyes to the ground and didn't look people in the eye. She placed a veil over her face so all you could see was a narrow sliver of her eyes. But then she started participating in our Women's Empowerment Self-Help Group. Eventually, Sani was asked to lead the health and nutrition training program, and she began playing an active role in the Village Savings and Loan program. Sani began to build confidence and develop leadership skills, and she became a leader within her group. The women in her self-help group became her support system, and they really encouraged her to speak her mind. They, they saw that she was smart and that she was capable, and even though she only had a third grade education, she was really capable of great things, and they could see that. Her confidence began to grow, and she began to believe that she could do more to help herself and her family and her community. So she began to see herself as a leader. Two years later, she ran for public office in her village, and she is now the deputy mayor of her village. And she has an office in the community building, and she is so proud of that office. And she cannot believe how far she has come in, in just in the past four years. And she is a woman who is not afraid to speak her mind. When you go and see her, she looks you in the eye and she shakes your hand with such resolve. And it is just amazing as you hear her words to see how much she has changed. So now with COVID, Sani and thousands of other women like her all across Bihar are educating their neighbors and keeping their communities safe. They're supported by our project st um, staff and they have been conducting tele-sessions. So working with other women's self-help groups in their areas and they're using cell phones, which amazingly are now a feature of every village, even the smallest villages in India. They cover topics like why it is important to wear a mask, why it's important to socially distance and wash hands. They have encouraged the um, development of small enterprises. Women sent, um, that used to make dresses are now making masks. They talk about the signs and symptoms of COVID and where to go if someone gets sick. They talk about how important it is to stay healthy and safe during pregnancy and how to protect your baby from COVID. They are helping to identify families in their communities that are at risk of malnutrition and connect them with food vouchers because they know their communities and they know who is most in need. And we could not do our life-saving work without Sani and her fellow community leaders. The women in Sani's help group were her strength and her support. And, and now, now she is a role model to other young women and men in her community. She is inspiring women and men, just as she inspired me and touched, touched me. And she is changing the corner, her little corner of the world. She is dreaming big dreams for herself and her community. She is a woman who is changing the world. And it really began when she began seeing herself as a leader. So I offer that as an example of the importance of the work that we do. And this kind of work is taking place in small communities all around the world. This is the kind of on the ground impact we need to combat COVID around the world. But happily, really happily, amazing people like Sani are present in every single community and they can be mobilized for good. So one of the current and still looming crises that keeps me up at night is food insecurity. The FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization, has determined that after years of improvement, and you heard this from David, the number of people facing hunger is increasing around the world. More than 820 million people, one in every nine, suffers from undernourishment. And while significant progress has been made towards ending hum hunger over the last 30 years, that progress has begun reversing itself since 2015, with the, beginning with the refugee crisis and now with COVID. And that's leaving more and more people at risk of malnutrition. 
and COVID has only made the situation worse. People living in poverty can spend 60 to 80% of their income on food, which means prioritizing food over other important needs such as healthcare and education and housing. So at PCI and Global Communities, our goal is to identify and address the underlying causes of hunger in order to support long-term lasting solutions. And our food security programs are designed to end hunger and malnutrition by improving climate smart and nutritionally targeted agricultural practices, strengthening livelihoods, as you heard from David, improving health and nutrition and hygiene pack, uh, practices, and also supported integrated school feeding programs. As with all our programs, these are approach, uh, approaches that are founded upon really strong community engagement and a commitment to sustainability. I was uh, speaking not too long ago with David Beasley, who is the former governor of your great state, and he currently is the director of the United Nations World Food Program, and he has warned that we are on the brink of a hunger pandemic and that the economic impact of COVID-19 could kill more people globally than the disease itself. It's something we all need to be concerned about. His agency predicts that coronavirus could push an additional 130 million people to the brink of starvation. So in the dry western corridor of Guatemala, PCI and Global Communities Partner is implementing an emergency food security program that has been a tremendous success. In 49 communities, the prevalence of underweight children has dropped from 14% to just 2.5% over the past three years. We have had to really redouble our efforts as the twin effects of COVID and climate change have made it harder and harder for families to access the food they need to stay healthy. In fact, just literally 20 minutes ago, I was on the phone with uh, Ken Isley, who's the administrator of the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture's Foreign Agricultural Services Office, and they fund our work. And we we're talking about the adaptation we need to do in Guatemala to ensure that we don't let the, the pandemic put the programs we do at risk. So right now, more than 30 of our field workers are continuing to work with small-scale farmers, farmer groups in that vulnerable part of Guatemala to distribute uh, seeds and provide socially distant farmer trainings while promoting COVID-19. We also provide cash transfers, which is an incredibly important tool in the development toolbox, which puts money and power into the hands of families so that they can make their own decisions about their own needs and their own solutions and their own futures. Cash transfers are fast and they can be done digitally through mobile apps and they provide an immediate boost to local economies and businesses. So these efforts have fostered resilience in the face of the pandemic and, and participants are reporting that they have enough food at the household level because of these measures despite the lockdown orders. So that's good news in that one small part of Guatemala. These ideas many of which, most of which actually, originate from the communities themselves are more important than ever as we, be, as we work to combat all the multi-level effects of the pandemic. We're going to have to think differently and we're going to have to be bold if we meet the need that is before us. You know, I know that every day when I wake up and I read the news or I scroll through social media, sometimes it's, it just makes me feel hopeless. But honestly, as David said so beautifully, there really is reason for hope. We have seen progress before and we are seeing it still, despite the challenges posed by COVID. We know that innovative solutions that put communities in the lead, where communities themselves define their future, that is the path to health and peace and prosperity. So I, I suspect we're all here today because we share a global outlook and a belief that as the world grows more complex and more challenging, and as the pace of change accelerates, these changes make us more, not less interconnected. We care, all of us who are here on, on line today, care about the fate of young women in Tanzania or boys in Micronesia, not just because they have deep intrinsic value as human beings, but also because they may hold the keys to the future of our interdependent world. There is brilliance out there that is just waiting to be tapped. And I feel like it's our job to try to help nurture that incredible brilliance. 
especially now as we face a historic pandemic that is changing every facet of our lives in every single country of the world, we recommit ourselves to the idea that we are not and have never been alone, that our neighbors may be around the block or around the world, but they are still our neighbors. And our success or our failure is theirs too. So I guess those are a few thoughts I have today. I'm so grateful for your time and your participation and your interest, and I'm really looking forward to a robust discussion. So back to you, Rob. Right. Um, Carrie, um, you mentioned women, and uh, it, there's a saying that when you educate a man, you educate one person, but when you educate a woman, you educate a community. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what, how that you've seen that and, and uh, the issues of working with women and how that has really empowered more than just the um, one person? That's for you. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, um, thank you. Thank you for that question. It's a question that's really um, very dear to my heart. Women represent the largest untapped resource for social and economic development in our world today. Uh, um, Bill Gates went, was invited by the king of Saudi Arabia to visit and the king asked him, what can we do to develop our country? And Bill Gates said to him, educate and empower your women. And it is true. We will not be able to unleash the incredible power, intellect, and talent of women around the girls, though, unless we address the institutional barriers to women's full and equal participation in society. That is the problem. There are institutional barriers. There are systemic barriers that keep women and girls from equally participating. So as you heard, you know, PCI and Global Communities, we work with women and, gr and girls in 36 countries around the world. And we, what we do is we ensure that they have the skills and the tools and access to capital that they need to lift themselves and their families out of poverty. And um, one of the programs that I love so much is called Women Empowered. It's a privately funded program and it's the foundation of everything we do. It's a village savings and loan program where women come together in groups of 10 or 15 people to save money and learn basic financial literacy and entrepreneurship skills. And they, like you heard um, about Sani and in, uh, India, they support each other and they help each other to develop leadership skills. And, we talk a lot about the importance of education, of, especially for girls' education, but also we talk about household decision-making and domestic violence and HIV AIDS, whatever issues affect them now. And now we're talking about COVID. So I, you know, one of our programs, one of our newer programs actually is in uh, Ethiopia. And I, I met a woman there named Tayaba, and she was a small-scale farmer. And she had three daughters who didn't go to school because they couldn't afford the school fees. And she had, she had actually given birth to five children, but two of those children had died in, in infancy. And she had absolutely no financial decision-making authority in her family and um, really just felt that she had no power whatsoever. And she, she was a small-scale honey producer and she sold the honey on the side of the road. And, and with her local knowledge, she was able to produce about five pounds of honey a year, which she then sold literally by the side of the road. So we started um, working in collaboration with USAID, the US Agency for International Development, which is really our foreign assistance um, program and is a terrific agency um, and has funded some of the amazing work that has lifted the world out of poverty. Um, but they have a food security program. And as part of that, we started a, a women's empowered group. Uh, and Taiba didn't believe actually in the beginning that she was capable of saving money, but she went along anyway. And she started bringing something equivalent to like a nickel or a quarter every week. And then eventually she, she um, was able to earn more money. And through Revive, we were able to bring a local honey production expert to meet with the women so that they could learn about improved honey production and better hive management. And so then with the money she saved, Taiba was able to buy five large industrial size beehives with training from USAID. The following year, she produced 115 pounds of honey as opposed to her original five. And not only that, because of her improved hive practices, her honey was of better quality and she was able to sell it to a local honey producer who bought her entire harvest. So she didn't have to sell honey on the street. 
So now her three daughters go to school. She's built a cement block home with a tin roof and she has three goats. And she's pouring her money back into her business and to her family. And she's hiring other local women to help her manage her hives. She's getting active in village politics. And she says that her husband treats her much better and that, that her relationship with her husband is changing as she brings more money into the family. So, you know, that may not sound a lot to us, you know, from five pounds of honey to 15 pounds of honey, the new house and the daughters in school. But to Taiba, it has absolutely changed the trajectory of her life. She sees herself differently. She is no longer a cowering wife with no resources of her own. She now sees herself as a leader and as a role model to other girls. She sees herself as an entrepreneur and as a businesswoman and as a civic leader. And she is a woman on fire. And it's because she has tapped into her own individual power and potential. So that is just an example. And, and you know, that's a tiny example of, of millions of people around the world and the kinds of things that can be done by educating and empowering women and girls. Great. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, in our talking, you both shared stories uh, about uh, some of the interaction you've had with some of the uh, politicians in Congress. Uh, uh, David, you talked about um, Lindsey Graham, and uh, Carrie talked about Johnny Isaacson, who is uh, retiring this year as a Georgia senator. So, uh, David, would you want to start and share that story? Because I thought it was a great story, and we'll go to Carrie afterwards. Uh, sure, Rob. There's a lot of Lindsey Graham stories. He's a colorful personality, and uh, He's, I know, also a controversial personality, but in the context of this discussion, Lindsey Graham is probably the biggest, most consistent supporter of U.S. foreign assistance around the world. Um, and he chairs the Appropriations Committee in the Senate and has been key to ensuring that our government keeps a robust level of funding for these kinds of programs. So, uh, so we've, had, we've worked a lot with Lindsey Graham um, and this is, I forget how many years ago, three, four years ago, but he, uh, was talking about some of the, we were in a little small group and he was talking about some of the, the challenges of bringing in people, uh, other members of, of Congress and particularly in the Senate who are real skeptics about foreign aid and getting them to vote for, to appropriate these kinds of programs. And he said, there's the key to his success is he would invite the senators to go travel with him to a developing country where we have U.S. aid programs. Um, and he, most of them, the skeptics were men. He would always ask them to bring their wives along with them. And he would take them out to a, you know, poor village somewhere and they'd be talking to a, a woman, you know, mother maybe who's, you know, had a, child that might have died other than the fact that they had this aid program for maternal and child health and and she was you know very dramatic and the Lindsey Graham said he would look around and he when he started to see the tears coming down the cheeks of the senators wives he knew he had their vote <laughs> vote against the program in the future okay. That's a great story, David. Um, I'm also on the board of USGLC with David and Rob was also, and I know that the World, of, um, World Affairs Council and Upstate International are really committed to doing this kind of advocacy to ensure that um, policymakers uh, are supporting this work and, 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 and supporting in particular America's leadership in the world today. And it's so important. I just have a small um, little story from Johnny Isaacson, as you mentioned, Rob is a senator, retiring senator from Georgia, and also very actively involved in the um, Foreign Affairs Committee of the Senate and was head of the Africa Subcommittee for many years. But he told me this quote once, and this is about the power of, of advocacy, really. He said to me, he said, give me data, so give me results, and you'll win my head. Give me a story, you'll win my heart. But if you give me both, you'll win my money. So I just thought I'd share that story. I always remember that. 
as an advocate, I try to provide results and a story. Great, great. Uh, I hope, uh, Carrie, you will be able to stick on for a few more minutes after one o'clock because we have a lot of questions coming up and I don't know if you are available. I know David said he can. So both of you were involved in the Peace Corps and I just kind of wondered how that prepared you or inspired you to the work you're doing now. Well, one thing I'll mention, um, and Carrie's been far more involved in the Peace Corps than I have, and I should really, I'll defer to answer this to her, but one thing I would say <clears throat> is that in both organizations, the PCI and Global Communities, uh, we have many people who are former Peace Corps volunteers on our staff, um, and we have people in, in senior roles as well, starting with Carrie as a former Peace Corps director, uh, but others as well, um, and people on our board who have been involved with Peace Corps. And the essence of that and how it's shaped our organization, I think, is that you know, Peace Corps is a grassroots organization. Pe Peace Corps volunteers, when they volunteer, know that they're going to go out to a, a, you know, a distant area, uh, maybe a remote area, um, and be fending for themselves, working in a, maybe a small village somewhere. But it's that ability to do that and, and work at, a, at the community level and engage with local community members as equals and empower people uh, in the local communities that's become part of our culture and part of our really are, are now our methodologies for how we operate our programs internationally. So I think the, the, the sort of the founding principle of Peace Corps has really become a, a very significant part of both our culture and our success. Yeah, that's true. Um, so as Rob mentioned earlier, I come from the, I think only four generation Peace Corps family, and you might wonder how that would happen. My aunt was the first volunteer, and she um, was actually the 10,000th volunteer. Um, they did a big write-up on her in Time Magazine, which was totally, you know, the, the luck of the draw. She was number, number 10,000 to swear in. There was nothing particularly remarkable about her, although she is a remarkable woman. Um, but she served in Turkey, worked as, uh, in, in an orphanage. My grandparents served in Malaysia in the Peace Corps in the early 70s. So that's the generation above my, mother, my aunt. And then my husband and I and my cousin all served in the 80s. And then my nephew served as a Peace Corps volunteer uh, 2007 to 2009 in Mozambique and did HIV work. So that's how the four generation thing worked out. Um, I mean, Peace Corps changed my life and changed the life of my husband as well. Um, for me, the thing that changed the most and the, re and the reason I'm so passionate about, um, about engaging with communities and, and listening to and learning from communities is that I discovered my passion for public health as a volunteer. As a volunteer, I was a teacher in an all-girls Catholic school, but my host family was um, Losa and Vianney, and they had eight children when I arrived, and then she became pregnant with her ninth. And I went through that pregnancy with her and just seeing the difficulties that she had in accessing care that would ultimately save her life. And in particular, I learned so much from an amazing midwife who was um, in the village where we both lived and who literally saved Losa's life. It's what made me want to go into public health and to um, women's reproductive health in particular. So, um, and my husband, he had been a math teacher and he loved education, um, but had never, had really never been on a plane before he met me and we went into Peace Corps. And um, he now is a, quite a well-known development economist and head of a program in global human development at Georgetown. And his life is also just completely changed by Peace Corps. Peace Corps is the on-ramp to um, our country's, I think, development and in some ways diplomacy workers. But, but Peace Corps volunteers or return Peace Corps volunteers as they're called are everywhere. They're in schools and businesses, they're in government and they're in Congress. Um, Joe Kennedy is a return Peace Corps volunteer and many others. Um, so, it, you know, David um, did such a nice job of representing the way in which they build bridges 
of, of hope and love between our nation and the world, uh, volunteer at a time. But, you know, I know that everything I learned about development, I, you know, I got, I got my start at, uh, as a Peace Corps volunteer. Right. Uh, I know I shared this story is that uh, in a remote area in Nepal, they hadn't seen anybody like me in a long time. And the last time it was, was someone who'd been there like 25 years before from Pittsburgh. And they asked if I knew this person, which was like, <laughs> it's like just left it a question on me. Um, David, you have uh, with communities, global communities worked in Liberia and uh, dealt with the Ebola uh, crisis there. And uh, I may want, like you to share a little bit about what you did there, but also how did that prepare you for working with COVID-19 in these uh, countries? Sure. Um, thanks, Rob. I'm happy to talk about that for a minute or two. I think, one, our work, and I'll describe it in a moment, but I think it's actually a, a good example of sort of how U.S. taxpayer dollars in a very small um, program at a place like Liberia <clears throat> can be so important and have such an impact. We were initially working in Liberia before the Ebola crisis hit in a small water and sanitation project. I mean, small in terms of the, the funding amount. And basically, <clears throat> we were working in three out of the 15 counties um, doing water and sanitation projects. 350 communities um, and in those communities basically it's a little bit of a term of art in the, in the water and sanitation world but it was creating open defecation free communities. So basically helping people learn how to build latrines and install latrines in their communities. Basic hygiene you know, around hand washing and so on, which of course is all these things are relevant to COVID-19. Um, but it was a small investment in 350 communities. When Ebola hit, um, the, the, one of the three counties we were working in was the epicenter of the Ebola crisis when it started in Liberia. Um, and <clears throat> in the 350 communities where we had finished this work, uh, on water and sanitation, every single one of them throughout the Ebola crisis remained Ebola free as it was spreading around them. Um, which just tells you something that just basic things like washing your hands, same with COVID, you know, just taking the most basic precautions can help prevent a crisis. Now, that was in three counties. There were um, you know, 15 total counties in Liberia and Ebola was spreading rapidly and particularly around the capital in Monrovia. And so what happened was the U.S. military, you know, as you may remember, President Obama dispatched the U.S. military for a big response. They were building um, um, Ebola treatment centers uh, in rural parts of the country, but those were not having what people had expected to be the kind of positive impact, you know, hoped for. You know, there was, I think, at one point, maybe a 30% survival rate of, in, in the treatment centers, got up to maybe a little 40, maybe closer even to 50%, but still a lot of people were dying even after going to treatment centers. Where the vector of the disease started to drop dramatically was when when was centered around what was happening to those who had already died. So people, the Liberian people have very, very strong customs and rituals around how they treat their loved ones when they die. Um, and generally people will come, they'll keep the body in the house. People will come from, you know, villages all around, you know, from relatives and friends. Um, and they do a sort of ceremonies washing the bodies and Ebola spreads by, you know, um, bodily fluids. And when you start taking somebody who's died from Ebola and you're using your own hands and washing them with it, it, it spreads rapidly. And so the key uh, became getting people, getting those dead bodies out and buried as quickly as possible. Because we had been doing this, this work 
for a long time, for you know, for years at the local community levels, we our staff there had gotten to know the, the local tribal chiefs, really built a lot of trust with the communities. And so we were able to send people to the farthest reaches in every single county by the end of the crisis to get those dead bodies out and buried within 24 hours. Um, and when we got to that point where we could do that in 24 hours, and we literally had to <clears throat> cut away jungle and build our own cemetery before the government would allow us to do it. But when we could get them out within 24 hours, all of a sudden the rate of Ebola dropped dramatically. Um, so that was a real key. Um, but again, I think the, the lesson there was, was several fold. One of them was that community kind of engagement that you've heard both Carrie and I talk about so much, um, building trust in the local communities. That's what enabled us to be able to do that, number one. And the other thing is this basic sort of, you know, sanitation uh, um, work is so relevant to preventing, the, you know, or, and stopping diseases like COVID. Um, so those are kind of some lessons learned from Ebola. Um, and if you look at what happened with the Ebola crisis, I mean, we had a, you know, only a couple of instances in the United States um, that were very, very contained. But it was really the ability to prevent the spread of Ebola to become a, a more global pandemic and come into to country, other countries like our own. Um, and that's again where I think you know the U.S. tax dollars and foreign you know that pay for our foreign assistance programs are so so worthwhile and so effective. Great. Um, and, and Carrie, you can stay on for a few more minutes because uh, we have a lot of questions. In for a few more minutes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, so all right, a um, couple of questions we have. Well, one of them was uh, evidently we have somebody asking about your projects. Are you working in Colombia? Because we have a big Colombian community in uh, the uh, upstate. I can take that on. Um, we've worked in Colombia for almost 20 years um, and we're continuing to work. We've had a whole variety of different programs uh, over that span of period of time. Um, and we ended our last program in Columbia less than a year ago. So we've got a, now a kind of a funding gap, but we still retain some of our local Colombian staff members because we have um, opportunities to get some new funding that we're waiting to hear on to continue in Colombia, but we have a long track record in Colombia. And for, you know, when I first became involved with global communities, Colombia actually was our largest single program of operation with multiple different types of programs. Here's the, the, the thing about Colombia though. When we started there, of course, Colombia was in the midst of, you know, literally speaking, kind of a, a civil war. Um, it had one of the largest internally displaced populations in the world. And many of our programs were helping, you know, poor farmers who had been displaced by their, uh, from their farms, from their land by guerrilla groups um, and migrated to the cities, but with no, no skills, so no ability to get jobs. So we had programs designed to assist those kinds of people. You know, in more recent years, we were also assisting people to be repatriated to their land um, as the peace, uh, agreement was being negotiated. Um, and our last big program, uh, it was a huge program funded um, by a private sector company. Um, and it was very multifaceted, but again, it was working in the most difficult areas um, for the peace agreement where um, the members from FARC were returning, you know, back into areas where they shouldn't have you know, they weren't supposed to under the agreement and the farmers were being threatened. And so that was kind of one set of types of activities. But more recently, our discussions with the government of Colombia about future work there, um, we predominantly hear the effects of the Venezuelan refugee crisis um, and how that's impacting Colombia. Um, and 
how it's straining the peace agreement and it's straining their their own budgetary resources and so on. And so they need help uh, desperately with dealing with the Venezuelan refugees who are who are you know spewing across the border um, and straining you know everything from you know their health systems and education systems and so on. Um, so we're we're very anxious to get you know work going again in, in Colombia, which Colombia is a place, I've been there many, many times. It's kind of near and dear to my heart as well. Um, so I'm looking forward to being back in Colombia. Okay. Uh, I'll, uh, also, I'll also offer yeah. one more fun fact about Colombia, and that is that the, the um, Peace, Corps at Peace Corps' very early beginnings, the group going into training for Colombia was the very first group of volunteers mobilized in Colombia. Return Peace Corps volunteers from Colombia are very proud of the fact that they were the first to enter training and were the first Peace Corps volunteers. Although there is some dispute with Ghana because the volunteers actually arrived in Ghana before the volunteers arrived in Colombia because in Ghana, which is an English speaking country, they didn't have to have all that language training in the United States. And in for Colombia, they did. So they dispute that fact. But Colombia features very prominently in Peace Corps history. Great, great. Uh, real question about the availability of masks uh, in these different areas that you work. So the face I mean, mask. There, it, yeah, I mean, in general, the availability of any kind of personal protective equipment is limited. I mean, we've all had challenges here in our country, um, maybe not so much with masks, but with tests and gloves and what have you. And that is certainly the same in the countries where we work. That said that mask making has become a, a new enterprise. And I know that a lot of our women in power groups are, have pivoted in terms of their product offerings to offer masks as um, one of the products that they are making and selling on the market. And if you go to our website, you'll see some wonderful pictures from Guatemala with, you know, women who are, and men who are lined up and they're going to food distribution centers or they're working with, um, you know, they're uh, shopping in the markets, but they're all wearing masks, beautiful masks made out of local, um, local fabric. Um, but the, but, I have to say that the personal protective equipment has been really a, a, a huge issue and one that USGLC and Interaction, which is the uh, umbrella organization of American nonprofit and um, nonprofit organizations working in the international development and humanitarian assistance sector, we've been very concerned about the ability to procure personal protective equipment, um, masks, gloves, but also other things. Um, Know, the, the suits that are needed, um, even ventilators, for our programs um, with U.S. government funding. It's been a challenge, although the U.S. government has recently changed its regulations and that is not possible. I think if I could just uh, add to that, Rob, in terms of all the different types of equipment, of course, masks are something, as we've seen in our own community in the United States, that people can make. And you know, in most of the countries where we work, where people are very resourceful, if we can give them materials, um, you know, they will they will make their own masks. And we've pivoted in programs that were originally designed to do other types of activities, but to now having, you know, groups of people, men and women, sewing masks and distributing masks, and in some cases, starting little businesses and, you know, to also be entrepreneurial and, and derive some income from making masks. But when you get to the kind of equipment that's needed in hospitals, like ventilators, um, you know, that's much more challenging in the developing countries where you just don't have the, the kind of healthcare system to start with that we have in the United States, not much less the equipment. So I think, I think that's where some of the real challenges uh, will be. And remember, the wave is much earlier now, you know, hitting the... Uh, developing countries than the United States. You know, if you think about it, sort of how it's progressed from China to Europe, to the United States, Latin America, now across the developing world, Africa, Middle East, India, uh, and so on. It's, um, you know, th they're just in the early phase of this. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, from my work in Nepal. 
Oh, yes. I'm sorry, Definitely. one other thing from a public health perspective, having the availability of test kits, testing, to be able to target an effective response is absolutely critical. It's a critical part of any kind of public health response. And that has been a huge challenge in our country, and it's even more of a challenge in developing countries. So especially in a place where there are very scarce resources, understanding the epidemic is critically important, and that tool is just not available in most places. Okay, we have a, a question, uh, and I know from being in Nepal or, and, and, and working there now, particularly now, the, um, there's a lot of people have been hungry because they stopped work and no transportation and they're living in the city. So there's reportedly 130 million people who are, are starving at this point, and there's a disruption of the food, train, the food chain of, of things. And so I know that this can be different for cities than it is from the country, but can you talk a little bit about that? Because that's a big concern for everybody. I don't know who's interested in or Carrie, you want to take that one? I, I would just maybe start by saying I noticed also there was a question in the chat about sort of what, what can people here do to help? Yeah, I was going to say that to the end. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, we're very concerned about food security, and not just in developing countries, but also here in this country. Um, if I could just say that we have a program in San Diego that is um, – similar to those that we have overseas. I talked about the work that we're doing in Guatemala, but let me just speak for a moment about the work we're doing right here in, in the United States. Um, so as an example, in San Diego, we're working, we're already funded in a maternal and child health program that is targeting those families that have the very poorest health outcomes, and they tend to be um, black, the black and African community. So there are refugees, there are African Americans, um, there, are, there are Haitian communities. So I mean, it's basically communities that are vulnerable, but our program targets especially the African American and African diaspora communities. And um, we work with community health workers, just like we work overseas. And these community health workers come from the community it's themselves. They have relationships of trust with the families and because they know their family that their community they can target those families that are most in need so we've been doing this already um, with funding from um, the health and human services the department of health and human services again your tax dollars at work um, for a number of years but with covid what we found is that some of that many of those families were the families that were either working in the service industry they may have been working in the informal sector, but they are um, they are the working poor, and if they are if they lose their job, they are they are right on the brink of homelessness. And so we've had to supplement our ongoing work around maternal and child health with um, uh, handing out vouchers for groceries. So we work with private sector quite a lot with the private sector um, and with the food banks um, in San Diego. We're giving out cards where they can buy uh, um, food at a local grocery store. Again, trying as much as possible to put the money in their hands so that they can make decisions about what they need most. Not all families are the same. If they have a small child, they may need diapers or they may need baby food. Um, maybe they need, you know, they live in a food desert. And so we, we connect them with um, healthy vegetables. Um, and other program other programs that provide food so a lot of what we're doing is connecting people to services that already exist in the community but that they don't know are available to them um, we also have a flexible funding mechanism because some people have really suffered the only thing that because they've lost the job the only way they're um, able to not be on the street is because we can support them with uh, funding for a little bit of uh, of rent um, support, or maybe it's the car payment um, if their car breaks down and they have a job but they can't get to work. So as much as possible, we're trying to tailor the support we provide to meet the individual needs of that family. But we are only able to do that because of the deep knowledge and trust we have already built up over years of working with that community. Um, and understanding their needs and being able to meet them. And so far, none of the families we have worked with, and we work with about a thousand families there, um, have, um, have fallen into homelessness as a result. Um, and they're able to get the food that they need. I have to say that a lot of the food banks have really stepped up in this country 
you know, David was very eloquent about the challenges in the other countries where they don't have food banks and don't have a social safety network. But those are some of the kinds of things that we're doing here in this country. Great. I might add to that if I may, Rob. Yes, sure. Um, just picking up on Carrie's last point, I mean, we have a robust system in the United States of food banks, thank goodness. Um, and I've mentioned several times that we sort of, we don't have that in the developing countries, but what we do have and work with in the developing countries is the World Food Program um, and other programs like it. But World Food Program, food program as you know, is a UN agency um, and we've partnered with them um, as do other NGOs in terms of being their on the ground organizations in a given country to actually distribute food, which they you know, will ship in. But prior to COVID, we were already facing on a global level um, an unprecedented number and magnitude of humanitarian crises. Since they've been, since people have been tracking them, we've seen more in the last, you know, five years than ever. And you're talking, and, and we're talking about sort of the, oh, the worst humanitarian crisis is the war in Yemen, the war in Syria, all the refugees that have been displaced by these crises, um, not to mention other types of humanitarian situations. And already pre-COVID, given those crises, organizations like the World Food Program were cr already critically underfunded. Um, and it's, you know, the UN, you know, uh, Commission for, you know, refugees and so on. I mean, there's a lot of agencies and organizations that just are desperate for more funding. And now it's magnified all the more with COVID. And so I think one thing that anybody can do to help is to, you know, it, it, it sounds a little corny, you hear it all the time, but you know, write your congressman, write your, write your senator, tell them the critical importance of funding these organizations. Great. I'm going to, uh, uh, the last kind of question for both of you, but I'd like, um, Carrie, to, for you to end with that story that you have. But uh, w your organization is one that I personally believe in because, um, like, some organizations are very top-heavy and only a little percentage goes. So I would really appreciate hearing from you guys and seeing what you do. So tell us how we can help you, per se, besides the fact that we need to uh, make sure that USAID gets funded and things like that. Uh, so, Dave, you want to start, and then Carrie, would you finish with your story? Sure. Well, you can always go on to uh, either the Global Communities or PCI website and hit the donate button. <laughs> that's one way. That's one way people can help. Okay. I'll, I'll let Carrie uh, take the rest of that answer to that well, question. Yeah, I mean, I guess anyway. the other thing I would say, and this builds on what you were talking about earlier in your last statement, is the U.S. government is the biggest contributor to all of the, the uh, incredible multilateral efforts that are um, supporting COVID response and food insecurity around the world. So the World Food Program, the United Nations, you know, all of those efforts depend on U.S. government funding support. And so all of you play a critically important role in in raising your voice to your members of Congress um, and your community, even in your community, it's so important just to talk about the importance of U.S. global leadership in this time when it's under some amount of threat, frankly. Um, because we live in a world that is so desperately in interconnected, our security, our economic prosperity is very much inter intertwined with that of the rest of the world. And COVID is probably the best example we've had for years of the interconnectivity of our world. So we will not make it if we don't help our neighboring countries to also make it. And that message is important to share with everyone you know. And I think, you know, this, this is not a political statement, but voting your um, conscience in the voting, uh, you know, in the voting booth is also really important. I mean, we all have a civic responsibility to do what we can to make our priorities known, however we do it. Um, but I did want to end on a story, and this is a story about the importance of really of 
Peace Corps and USAID. Uh, it's particularly a Peace Corps story, um, but also talks about the engagement with USAID. And this is the story that I heard from General Carl Eikenberry, who was a four-star general, is a four-star general, um, had a long and very distinguished career in the army. And then he was appointed to be the ambassador to um, Afghanistan. And he served there, I believe, for four years. And while he was there, um, he told me that he, there was a particular battle that was fought by U.S. Marines um, to, to um, try to secure a very critically uh, important, strategically important um, area in Helmud province. And um, it was a brutal battle, battle against the Taliban. And in the course of the battle, 15 Marines were lost. And of course, he was devastated. The whole community was devastated. And so after peace was restored and the Allied forces were successful, he went down to that community to try to build relationships with the local chieftains because the chieftains were key to ensuring that peace was, um, was maintained. So he went there and he, he, um, he, he flew into a, you know, a, a neighboring airport and then he drove out in his armored vehicle in his long, long entourage to this particular village. And as he approached the village, the headman came out of, of the, um, his house and, and ran to the, to the um, entourage and he was very excited and he was waving his hands and he was speaking in Farsi and he was obviously so excited to see this team of people coming. And the ambassador was amazed at this wonderful warm welcome. And so he asked his translator, you know, what is this gentleman saying? And they spoke for a moment and he, and then the, the translator said to um, Ambassador Eikenberry, he said, um, he's asking about a guy named Rick. And Ambassador Eikenberry looked around and he, looked at his colleagues and he said, is there anyone named Rick here? Who's Rick? And the translator asked the village chieftain for more information. And this is what he said. He said, Rick was a Peace Corps volunteer who had lived in his community 30 years before. And Rick was like a brother to that, that chieftain when they, when they were both high school students or, or actually he was a high school student and Rick was his um, teacher and he said he lived with, Rick lived with my family Rick, uh, Rick taught me English and together we used to work in the fields um, on an irrigation program that was funded by USAID um, but Rick was so he said Rick was so important to who I am today and I love Rick so much and when I heard the Americans were coming I was so hoping that Rick was among them and uh, General Eikenberry told me that he went home that night and he couldn't sleep. And he said, for me, that's unusual because I have learned to sleep in ditches, but I could not sleep that night. And he said, the reason I could not sleep is because I could not help but think that, that those 15 Marines who had given their life for that community, their names would never be known to that chieftain. But that one Peace Corps volunteer who had served 30 years previously, was still known and beloved by that community, in particular the chief. And because of that, they still welcomed Americans with open arms. Wow. And he said it was at that point that I understood the power of, of Peace Corps and the power of our soft diplomacy, the aid work that we do through USAID, the Peace Corps work, building relationships of trust between communities around the world. That work is essential to ensuring peace around the world. And since that time, General Eikenberry, Ambassador Eikenberry, has become a huge champion for both USAID, but especially for Peace Corps. And he speaks all over the country and he tells that story. So I just thought it was important to end with that because the work that is supported by our government is not just about um, distributing seeds or having a training. It's about building relationships of trust that allow people to achieve their full power and potential. And they're about the relationships of trust that stand the test of time. And that mean that even 30 years later, people who are important to us care about us 
even love our country because of, a, of, of the work that we did in their communities. And so I just thought that would, it would be a great story to end on. Yeah, that's, that is beautiful. Um, General Mattis said that if we spend money on, on aid and supporting and helping in these countries, it saves him having to spend a lot more money on bullets. So that is really the truth of it. Yeah. And so that is great. Um, I want to thank you both. That was just fantastic. I really loved it. I thought it was just everything I wanted, but he didn't answer all the questions. We ran out of time, but uh, we did get a start on it. So that was really good. Um, so David, Carrie, thank you again for joining us today. Um, and thank you again to the Community Journals and the Greenville Journal, our media sponsor for helping make this possible. Um, uh, just to let you know, our next event is with a, a former Ambassador Robert Blake on July 28th. So, stu you know, put that on your calendar from 12 to 1.30. And he's going to be talking about uh, the food chain issues, supply chain issues from Southeast Asia. So that'll be something. So you can go to uh, World Affairs Council Upstate or Upstate International, either one dot org or, or dot com, and you'll find uh, our thing and sign up for that. But again, this was very great. I want to thank you again, David and Carrie, for the work you do. It touches us. I think a lot of people responded, and I think um, keep it up, please, because making the world thank better at so times desperately, desperately need your the help that you're doing. Thank you so much, Rob, for those words. And thank all of you for your interest in uh, what's going on around the world and the kind of work that we're doing. That's, that's really meaningful for us to know that there's uh, this kind of level of interest around the country and in places like where you are in North Carolina. So it's really appreciated. Thank you. And thank you to the people of, of Greenville who, who um, you know, birth such wonderful organizations that elevate the importance of our international engagement. And, and it will be recorded. It's been recorded. So if you want to share this, we'll, um, it'll be put up on our, our website so that you can uh, get a chance to follow up and share it with other people. So thank you again. And uh, that's about all we have for today. And appreciate your coming to visit with us, everybody, and, and get to meet um, hopefully your new friends. Thank you. Bye-bye.